Chapter 3, Basic Principles of Classical Conditioning. Part 5. This last video for Chapter 3 focuses on applications of classical conditioning outside the laboratory. The textbook mentions classical conditioning of emotional responses, and I'm going to show you one example that illustrates how this process is used in advertising. Most of this part of Chapter 3 is about different behavioral therapies, uh, including sy systematic desensitization, aversive counter-conditioning, and Maurer and Maurer's associative treatment for nocturnal enuresis. In this video, I'm going to talk about exposure therapy, a kind of systematic desensitization used to treat anxiety and anxiety-related issues. Our emotional reactions to novel stimuli are often formed through association with familiar stimuli. If you learn that you and a new acquaintance have lots of mutual friends, you're probably inclined to like them more. You enjoy being around the same people, so there's a good chance you'll enjoy each other's company as well. Classical conditioning is a big part of advertising and marketing, and advertisers are experts at using associations with celebrities, images of people relaxing and having fun, and things like that to get us to like their products. For example, in this video clip, Jennifer Jordahl explains how Nike uses Colin Kaepernick's image to shape the way you feel about their brand. Believe in something even if it means sacrificing everything. The classical conditioning in this advertisement happens when the viewer sees Colin Kaepernick stand up for his beliefs no matter the cost. He sacrificed his career and reputation to take a stand against police brutality and is seen as the hero because of it. The unconditioned stimulus of seeing Kaepernick leads to the unconditioned response of feeling inspired by Kaepernick. Next, Kaepernick partnering with Nike brings together the neutral stimulus of Nike products and the unconditioned stimulus of Kaepernick and leads to the unconditioned response of feeling inspired. Finally, the neutral stimulus of Nike products turns into the conditioned stimulus. When viewers see Nike products, this leads to the conditioned response of feeling inspired by Nike products. The consumers involuntarily see Nike as a company that stands up for their beliefs and inspires people to improve their lives with Nike products by their side. Exposure therapy is a way of reducing anxious or phobic responses to particular stimuli through systematic desensitization and stimulus generalization. The very basics of exposure therapy are these. First, construct a hierarchy of situations or stimuli that elicit anxiety. Uh, this hierarchy is usually all related to a particular theme and it's important that the elicited response is disproportionate to the actual threat. So for example, if someone is afraid of heights, they might construct uh, a fear and anxiety hierarchy that includes driving over bridges, if that's something they avoid, and viewing scenic overlooks, but not uh, parkour on top of tall buildings, even if that's something that makes them feel afraid and something that they avoid. Number two, expose the person to a stimulus from uh, somewhere on the low end of the hierarchy and have them periodically report their anxiety, for example, by rating it on a zero to 100 scale. What usually happens is that with continued exposure to the stimulus, anxiety decreases. Third, once that response has changed, the anxiety has decreased, move on to the next item on the hierarchy. Change in fear responses over the course of a single exposure often looks a lot like a habituation curve. And for a long time, clinical psychologists referred to exposure therapy as a form of habituation. Recall that habituation does not endure the way classical conditioning does. A habituated response can recover with the passage of time. Now, if the mechanism of exposure therapy were habituation, one implication is that fear reduction during an exposure trial is necessary for the therapy to be effective at changing the perceived harm associated with the phobic stimulus. This didn't sit well with some clinical psychologists because sometimes exposure doesn't work in the moment. The person's fear or anxiety spikes and then stays pretty high throughout the exposure. According to the habituation model of exposure therapy, those trials are failures. Best case scenario, they have no long-term impact at all, and if anything, they're detrimental to treatment. 
This is because, according to the habituation model, the reduction in fear or anxiety today should be correlated with the strength of the initial response tomorrow, or whenever is the next time the person encounters the stimulus. However, there's plenty of evidence from laboratory experiments with humans and other animals, as well as from clinical research, that the reduction in fear at the end of one session does not predict the strength of the response at the beginning of the next. So that raises the question, if the mechanism of exposure therapy does not involve habituation, what is it? Can you think of an alternative explanation that fits with what you read about systematic desensitization in chapter three? Michelle Kraske and colleagues have suggested that the mechanism of fear reduction in exposure therapy is inhibitory learning. The idea is that phobias and anxiety can be conditioned responses the person experiences something threatening or dangerous in the presence of certain stimuli, and then those stimuli become conditioned stimuli that elicit fear or anxiety related to their reaction to the threat itself. For example, if a child is repeatedly bullied in a parking lot behind her school, she might develop fear or anxiety whenever she's near the parking lot, that's the CS, even if her bullies, the US, are not nearby. That fear could generalize to other parking lots and other stimuli and potentially become a problem quite separate from the bullying itself. Kraske and colleagues pointed out that if we think of clinically significant fear and anxiety as components of complex conditioned responses, procedures that weaken conditioned responses should be effective treatments even if they don't produce fear reduction in the moment. With or without a noticeable reduction in fear or anxiety, Exposure is a form of what Kraske calls belief disconfirmation. For example, the child avoids the parking lot because she is afraid she won't be able to handle things, uh, the things that happen to her in the parking lot. Regardless of whether there's a reduction in the anxiety she feels, exposure to the parking lot is an effective way of reducing her avoidance because it functions as extinction. Either nothing bad happens, disconfirming the child's belief that she will be bullied or otherwise harmed in the parking lot, or something bad does happen and the child survives, disconfirming her belief that she's unable to cope with the feelings she has in the parking lot. Here, Kraske uses belief a little differently than you or I might. It means that, on some level, the possibility of being bullied or the child's own inability to cope is maintaining her avoidance of the parking lot. She may or may not be able to verbalize those beliefs herself, and she may or may not endorse them if asked about them. Exposure will function to extinguish her conditioned emotional response either way. Operating on the idea that exposure reduces avoidance of feared stimuli and conditioned emotional responses through inhibitory learning, Kraske and colleagues reasoned that procedures that have been shown to promote inhibitory learning in laboratory experiments can be applied to exposure therapy. In a 2014 paper published in Behavioral Research and Therapy, they made eight evidence-informed recommendations for optimizing the effectiveness of exposure. We're going to discuss them in class.